Open University. Hi, course. Um, this is me standing in front of the Swiss Institute, which will be my home for the next three days. Uh, Swiss Institute in Rome. And it's um, appropriately Swiss because it sort of stands on a little hill of its own, a sort of little alp, and has fantastic views out over Rome from the uh, roof. But um, I haven't updated you since May the 2nd. Uh, it's basically three weeks. So um, quite a lot has happened. It's quite an action-packed month because I've been on the trains going all over it. So I'm just going to talk through the photos I've been putting on my Tumblr page with the caveat that um, Tumblr is not reality, and my Tumblr especially is not reality. This is a, a sort of selected view. It starts with me reviewing the Berlin Gallery Week, uh, which I did for Spike magazine. And um, actually something interesting happened. These are images of um, uh, the Michael Muller exhibition, which I reviewed positively as part of that and uh, I just got an email from his gallery saying that he is inspired by my work and actually for one of his other exhibitions he has a, a t-shirt with a crossword on the front with the word Momus written into the crossword so and this was apparently a sort of a tribute to me so I'm humbled and they're sending me um, one of these t-shirts to Japan so uh, yeah, that disease is caused by masturbation image. That's part of his exhibition. It's a witty thing. Actually, this image of the flayed open um, medical <laughs> model, I suppose, someone who looks as if he's alive but also has all his in insides showing. This is something that Serge Gansburg had on his wall. If you see the photographs of Gansburg's house on the Rue de Vernay, you can see this image, also part of Michael's exhibition. These are images on the outside of the Alte Museum, and I actually went to see that just before leaving Berlin, see the, uh, the Etruscans exhibition to prepare me for Italy. What I'm doing in Italy is basically a sort of um, compressed version of the Grand Tour, which gentlemen had to take in the 18th century and into the 19th century. I've also been thinking while I'm here of um, Edward Lear's autobiography, or rather biography, which I read last year, which was a really interesting book and describes how artists... British artists were often based in Italy and would make these kind of standard paintings of uh, the views of the ruins. I think for my concert here at the Swiss Institute tomorrow, I'm doing a talk about sublimation and then I'm doing a concert. So I think I want to pluck out my most obscure songs with the most Italian references. So the Etruscan Shepherd, the artist overwhelmed, which is actually named after a, an image by Fuseli. Um, the Artist Overwhelmed by the Grandeur of Ancient Ruins is the full title. And, um, yeah, talk about all these obscure philosophers, the Empedocles song, um, that re really have uh, informed my work right from the year dot. Uh, Circus Maximus is, of course, the first Momus album, and it's also the Cerco Massimo, which is the old um, racetrack at the end, basically at the end of the Via Giulia, where I used to stay when I was um, coming here every summer with my friend Babis in the 80s. Uh, so actually, when I arrived in Rome the other night, I was on a train that was three hours late, and there was a thunderstorm, and um, showing images of Berlin while talking about Rome, it doesn't make much sense. Um, and... Um, it just reminded me of the lyrics to my song Paolo, uh, the lightning flashing lazily over the dome of St. Peter's and all that stuff. So there's a lot of those references. Obviously, Japanese aroma uh, is in Italian, which my Greek friend helped me to, uh, to put together. Okay, back to Berlin. So I'm in this uh, Airbnb place. I had nightmares, actually, with this Airbnb guy. He was really pernickety, um, you know, was demanding reparations for some tiny little stains that I dropped, like tea stains and things, dropped on his wall, which was very, very fragile, clay-surfaced wall. Um, and he was also, yeah, God, he was a, he was a pain. 
Um, I was sitting there reading Moray Vagine and Guillaume Apollinaire, basically putting together a bookshelf, which I then immediately had to put into my storage. So um, Berlin, towards the end of Berlin, I was um, getting very literary, I suppose, and, um, and thrifting a lot. And I discovered a new area for me, the sort of Rixdorf area at the end of the Karl Marx Strasse, as you get towards Neukölln Station, there's some very nice little markets there and second-hand shops, a good humana. Then I saw this exhibition of electronic music instruments, synths and things at the uh, Berlin Electronic... Uh, uh, sorry, not electronic, the Berlin Musical Instruments Museum, which is a fantastic museum, at the Kulturforum Potsdamer Platz. This is me um, getting my baggage together and moving into the um, Pestana Hotel, which I was kindly put up in for four days by the Hastri Kultur und der Welt. So this was my uh, sort of working part of my holiday in Berlin, uh, where I actually sat on the committee with um, about a dozen other people talking about the future of the institution, talking about the state of the world. And, um, yeah, that was... Um, a talking shop, essentially, very interesting, because these are, these other people were all artists of various shades. There was uh, um, a really interesting um, photographer, a Nigerian-born photographer, and a South African uh, writer based in California, and all sorts of other uh, very interesting people. These are images mostly of um, statues at the Alte Museum. And... Uh, more synths. I, yeah, I did this... Um, oh, yeah, I did this synth Etruscan thing, didn't I? Yeah, that's weird. I, I forgot that I did another video after the... Uh, or was that the last... Yeah, anyway, that was the last one. Okay, so here I am. I'm about to um, head off to... My rail pass basically starts. Actually, I was going to fly. I bought a ticket with EasyJet to fly to Naples on the Friday with with, a, with my concert due, actually to fly on Thursday with a concert on Sunday. Uh, so I was just going to be in the south of Italy for three days with nothing to do. So I decided at the last moment, when I was heading to the airport, I decided to, to take the train instead because I'd activated the train pass the same day as the flight. So I thought, let's do it, slow travel, surface travel, let's go to Italy on the train, and since I was already in the eastern part of Berlin, basically the Ostbahnhof, or Ostkreuz, I, um, I thought, well, I'll just keep going east and I'll go into Poland, because that's the, the fastest change of scene I could achieve, going to another country, because you're right, Berlin's very close to Poland, you're within a, you know, half an hour or an hour of the Polish border, and then you're quite close to Poznan as well. Frankfurt on the Oder River is the border between Germany and uh, Poland. What I didn't realize was that the trains in Poland are very slow, and um, so I kind of skirted down, taking very small lines. I mean, the high-speed trains are often, in each country, boring. They're almost like budget air lines. You know, they're overcrowded with people. There's a kind of... Uh, uh, you don't see the scenery so well, and things go too fast. So I like to take the route the branch lines or whatever they're called, the little back roads of the railway. But then that involves often, you know, sitting in some godforsaken town for uh, an hour, two hours, whatever, between trains. Going um, au is, uh is risky. So, okay, this these checkbooks are me finally reaching the Czech border. Um, because I, I go down through Poland and I actually have to stay the night in Poland, so I don't even manage to exit on Thursday uh, the first country. I stay overnight in a place called Katowice, and I, I find a youth hostel-type place, a, a hostelry above a bar, basically, which is very cheap, but it's just a bench. You sleep on a bench, and the, the door doesn't even fit the door frame properly. It was sort of amazing. Uncomfortable, but amusing for one night. Um, Katowice, and there was some sort of rock festival going on in the city as well. And um, so then I reached the Czech border, which is very close to Katowice. It's actually really hard as well. There's a kind of gravitational pull to the capital of a city, with the railroads all leading inwards towards its its capital. It's really hard to cross the border sometimes, because the local um, trains, even assuming the gauges are all the same and all that stuff, 
there are union regulations about staffing trains crossing borders. Often you have to change the crew when you reach the border. There's all sorts of um, complications, even in this open borders kind of e European Union. Um, so, uh, I mean, it obviously used to be a nightmare with the Iron Curtain and actually impossible in some cases. Anyway, this is me discovering in the first um, station I change at in Czechoslovakia, or Czechia, as it, I think it likes to be called now, or Czechia, whatever they, it sounds like the Chechnya, um, but they keep changing the name of the country. Yeah, I found these books which were just being provided free. There was a shelf, a very civilized idea, a shelf of books in the station which uh, they were giving away to people. Um, cork and Bottle McDonald Hastings, that means I've already reached, gosh, that's weird, I've already reached Venice. No, yes, Venice. Yeah, I was in Ve oh, this, this compre the, these images compress a lot of um, the time. But um, basically, I, I came down through the Czech Republic into Austria, um, down to the Italian border, and then to, into Venice, where I booked a hotel for the following week, but didn't stay, and headed on down to Rome. But actually, when I was in Venice, I did one brief walk around between trains, and I, there was a jumble sale, like a flea market out, outdoors in front of a church, and there was this delightful old... Um, Penguin Books edition of a, an English detective story by a guy called MacDonald Hastings from 1953 about an old insurance in, uh, investigator who uh, who goes to... The, it was the classic English village murder scenario, a bit like the one I sing about in my song, Murder in the Village, which I did last year. And then, so there are these images of uh, Venice. Oh, I actually also stayed in Austria one night. Yeah, it took me took me two full days of travel to get to Venice and then a full day to get down through Italy. So I didn't arrive at uh, Avellino until the day of my concert, until Sunday um, lunchtime. It actually took, it took that long on the trains. I always underestimate how long it takes. Um, yeah, these are images of uh, Austria all mixed up. Um, this Kavafis, where did I see that Kavafis thing? This is my, my current fetish collection of books, is these Ainaudi poetry books. And uh, this, um, I think that was just in a bookshop actually, the Kavafis one. Uh, whose books are these? Karl Kapek. Oh, these are the, of course, these are the books in um, Luca, the apartment of Luca, who I was staying with in um, Avellino. And um, he's got an amazing collection of books. Fantastic. He used to work in a, a used bookstore, that's why. And uh, so, yeah, I photographed his books. This is some photos of the gig. The gig went well. People actually came, which always amazes me. And then my plan the next day, leaving Avellino, I had to take the bus to Naples because Avellino used to have a train station, but neoliberalism and um, cuts of... Uh, have taken it away, so you have to take the bus to somewhere else. So I took the bus to Naples, and then the plan was to go across to, I think it's called Poggia, the town on the other side, the east coast of Italy. But Italy, of course, is very mountainous down its spine. Is it the Apennines? Um, and to cross from the, east, from the west to the east coast is actually no easy matter. It takes four hours, five hours, although it's a very narrow peninsula. So I was um, on this little train rattling across to Pescara, for like four hours, but it was beautiful scenery, very interesting, and very, very much the the road less travelled, which is how I like to do it. And um, yeah, that's me and Avellino, and me waiting for for the train. Pescara was actually a really nice town. It's the hometown of the poet D'Annunzio, and um, I really enjoyed it. It was it's by the sea. It's very refined somehow, the pedestrianised um, centre of town, very pleasant. Some really interesting shops, sort of very. Um, aesthetic overall and I found a, a nice cheap hotel and uh, so the next day I was heading up to Venice reached Venice um, got, got into my hotel which was pretty near the station and um, Venice is always at its best and it's in your first few hours when you walk about there when you go into especially the back streets away from the touristy touristic ones 
I was obsessed this time with the uh, trash collectors, with their boats, their brightly coloured safety gear. Um, there is a certain toxic masculinity in, in Italy which is markedly different from Germany or Austria, for instance. And um, it's the same kind you would find in North Africa. There's a certain kind of stare you get from men everywhere, especially in Rome, I find. People really stare at you, and it seems like it's hostile. People are quite rude in shops. They fling money down. They often don't say prego or uh, grazie. And, um, but there is, yeah, there is this kind of toxic masculinity thing which uh, southern countries seem to, seem to have and which we northern Europeans, or, or which Japanese for that matter, Japanese don't have toxic, toxic masculinity, uh, seems to be um, the cooperativeness and the harmony in Japan cancels that out. These are images of the Venice Biennale which I plunged into and saw on my second day in Venice. Um, I basically saw the Arsenale show and the Giardini show bang bang one after the other very fast um, and I'd been prepared by this Adrian Searle review in The Guardian for something terrible but actually I thought it was very good and Searle was sort of implying that it should be more political in the, the style of some of the recent biennials but uh, I think it was political but it just in a different way than you know the guerrilla girls or images of Trump or that obvious kind of identity politics style of American guilt, essentially, um, when there's an American curator. This time, Christine Marcel, the French curator, comes from the Pompidou Center, and they're known for, for instance, Les Magiciens de la Terre, the famous exhibition in 1989. There's a certain kind of French Orientalism, um, a fascination with the other and with other ways of thinking, and with non-Americanism, which I think Christine Marcel was also giving us in this biennial. So there was some fantastic stuff from... Um, the third, so-called third world. Um, actually, people were shouting that on the train when, when my train was broken down coming into Rome. People, the Italians were phoning up their friends and raging about how Italy was the third world. Terzo mondo. Um, these are images from the China Pavilion, um, a shadow play from the Cultural Revolution puppets. Here's Francis Ponge, uh, the um, party priest of things. This is really fantastic little prose pieces in which he simply describes something like a fruit or a, uh, yeah, some very um, random thing, but he, he really observes it with a poet's eye. And I bought this book in the end to add to my collection of these Ainaudi um, poetry books. Uh, they also had Walter Benjamin. These were books selected by the artists. The curator asked each artist to come up with a list of their favorite books. And... Um, what I really liked, and I actually don't know the artist's name, but I really liked a little corner of the um, Arsenale show which was dedicated to transgender Islamic singers. And these uh, people, as well as just birth women um, who, who sing in the Egyptian style of, say, the 1960s, these very passionate ballads and things. And um, that was really uh, amazing cassettes and books mixed in with very scientific books about sound and uh, theory of uh, clangus, the theory of sounds. There was uh, also uh, uh, the drawings of this um, Eskimo artist, um, whose name I forget, it's like something like Putu Guk, um, who draws um, you know, modern technology um, in a kind of traditional setting of uh, Iglulik or wherever he lives. And uh, I always am drawn to people who use books in uh, in their installations or paint books. There's a, a Chinese painter who paints books, including Reclam Editions, which is one of my other fetishes. This film and reality book has been punched through, or shot through with a bullet. This is an actual bookshop, which is a very famous second-hand bookstore, if you can find it in the center of Venice. I think it's called Antica something. And uh, it's kind of damp, and um, like a lot of Venice, in fact, a lot of Italy, it's almost an abandoned, dank, damp building, which nevertheless somehow still sustains life. And so much of Italy is ancient and ruined, and there's just about electricity, and there's just about plumbing. But um, in fact, it feels like the shell of an abandoned country, which still just almost incidentally has people in it. So this bookshop definitely has that feel. It's really like a 
a derelict building. But it has these amazing phones. Not that cheap, they're a little bit expensive, some of them like 10 euros. But uh, amongst them, Carnet, the notebooks of uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And um, yeah, the, the ni- another nice thing that happens in Venice is that you keep seeing the same people over and over. It's like a theme park for adults, uh, an art theme park when the biennial's on. And you see these um, couples, for instance, this uh, Chinese couple, he was shooting photographs of her all over town, almost as if she was a model. And she was, I'm always very attuned to people who are well-dressed, and I like to see them day after day to see how they're bringing the changes in their style as well, and changing their clothes. So this girl was, the first day I saw her, I wonder if I can find, these images are sort of out of order, actually, it's funny. The first day she's, um, oh, weird. The first day I saw her, she was uh, wearing a kind of yellow top with a, she she mixes kind of haute couture stuff with um, with kind of cartoony stuff. That's so weird. I wonder where that first image is. This software is a bit weird. Um, and um, so I was photographing her. And um, this is where I have to say that uh, my photos are kind of a lie because they're selective. I often... I'm very exasperated by how poorly tourists dress in particular <clears throat> with their, you know, their sports shoes with socks and their stupid Velcro um, attached rucksacks and uh, everything being blue, white, grey, black, you know, uh, and, and awful mesh caps. I really hate that view of the world which they represent. And they're, all, they're super conformist though, so it's easy to avoid them. In Venice you simply have to step off the main super highways, you know, the main pedestrian streets, and they're not there anymore. Uh, and actually there are still areas like around the ghetto, the Jew- Jewish ghetto area, a lot of areas of Venice which are just Venetians, just people living there and buying local stuff in local shops and actually looking a bit surprised to see a tourist. They're that confor- conformist. They simply stay on the, the main road to the station, the main road to St. Mark's Square. But yeah, I was saying about the clothes, these are a couple of people. See, I turn any city I go to into a, a faux Asian city. I tend to look for Asian people, photograph Asian people. They make me feel comfortable, they make me feel at home, and I think they wear much more interesting clothes. The colors of the Chinese tourists, for instance, this lady's silk, uh, silk dress, red and white, blending into each other. Or this other um, image on the right here where you see a, a woman in a headscarf. I think she was Korean, I'm not sure with white trousers and kind of flared pantaloon trousers like the kind I'm wearing quite a lot. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the, the colors and the styles of, the, of those Asian visitors. I also have been sort of collecting visually. I'm very interested in these um, news kiosks. Um, okay, so now this is me reaching Rome after a, this sort of mistake I made, which is that I, I, bought, I booked a ticket which would have got me early to Rome. I was planning to be in Rome by 5.30, staying with a friend in Rome, actually. Um, and um, But I decided, I, I got the train kind of for 10 o'clock in the morning after checking out of the hotel, decided to take a, a sort of little detour via Siena. So when I got to Firenze, to Florence, I changed to the branch line to Siena. Siena is kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's a bit hard to get to, and the train is very slow. So I got to Siena, and then I thought, well, there must be a train that goes south. And So I did manage to find a train that was leaving reasonably soon after that um, and kept going south down to uh, towards Rome. But um, there was some technical problem. There was like a, a fire in a signal box in Termini Station, which was causing these huge backlogs of traffic all over Italy. Any train going into um, Rome that evening, Friday night, was... Uh, subject to a two-hour delay, three-hour delay. In my case, it was three hours. We basically sat in a siding somewhere. And um, luckily, it was a very comfortable train with um, good air conditioning. And I was reading. I'd found I had a copy of Maiden Voyage by Denton Welsh on my iPad. So I was reading that with great uh, pleasure. Great book, Denton Welsh, one of my favorite uh, British writers. Uh, and Maiden Voyage is about him hating boarding school, running away from school, being taken back to school, and then being taken out of school to go to visit China for the first time, where his father was working in Shanghai. Um, and he's kind of got this very 
detailed eye for antiques and interiors and art styles. He became an art student after the events he's describing in Maiden Voyage. But he's also um, super sensitive to his own mental states, very hypersensitive guy. Um, that's a floor, by the way, in a shop in Venice that I always stop to photograph. Whenever I go to Venice, I seem to find this shop. It's just a grocery store, but it's got a beautiful floor. And this time, as I was taking the pictures, the lady came up and said, you know, can I help you? And I, I said, um, it's just a beautiful tiling floor. And she said, yes, it's very old. Um, it's very simple, but I like the, the interlocking. That's just another of my visual fetishes is tiled floors. Um, this is now images from Rome. We're in Rome. And... Uh, um, I had kind of a, a negative impression, first impression of Rome, walking around the Centro Storico, the historical area where I used to stay, the Via Giulia, the Piazza del Popolo. Um, it's kind of even more museumized and mummified than it was before. I went to this museum where there were these statues. I'd already seen so many Roman statues and Etruscan statues in Berlin because I went to the Alto Museum. It's so a, a big exhibition about the Etruscans. But um, it's sometimes interesting when you see an old satyr pawing at a, a Daphne, in this case. Uh, and Daphne happens to have a penis. You know, you kind of think, what, what is going on in those people's minds or on their bodies? The most interesting part of Rome was actually... Um, where my friend uh, Simona was was living, right next to Termini Station. It's the immigrant area, or an immigrant area, very mixed area. Bangladeshis, um, uh, Asians, um, all sorts of people, nuns. <laughs> so there's some fantastic markets there. Uh, there's a big square, which used to be where all the markets were outdoors. Uh, and they've all been moved indoors now, luckily, because it was raining very heavily on Saturday. But yeah, fish markets, clothes markets, lots of Indian clothes, really vital, um, with the vitality that the center of Rome, which is just dominated by tourists and sort of you know, embassies and fascistic you know, military trucks and guys with machine guns, and all the hotels are kind of called the Hotel Imperial or whatever. It's an objectionable kind of fascism, which you, you, you sense really in those rich areas, or the you know, Armani clothes, whatever. Um, luxury brands, that's all fascism as far as I'm concerned. And sports wear uh, is, is the modern equivalent of social Darwinism turned into clothes, basically. Um, and lots of ice cream and just people schlepping about. Um, didn't, I didn't have a good impression of that, but um, yeah, roundabout Termini Station, it gave me basically the ambience, the, the familiar and comforting ambience of an Asian city. So you can see images here of... Um, of that area, and this is that's a piece of butcher's meat, um, and this is yet another of these fantastic um, Einaudi books, which I discovered in the apartment of Simona, who, who's um, renting this apartment from her uncle, who has poetic and literary tastes, and so that's one of his books. And um, yeah, I think that's brought me up to date. Um, I'm playing a concert here tomorrow. Uh, after giving a lecture, I think the lecture starts at 5.30 or something and the concert's then at 7. And um, it's a fantastic luxury to have a, a big guest room in this uh, palatial cultural institute which also has a great library and um, beautiful sighting, up, you know, sort of rock gardens and you really sense being in Rome and yet not quite off Rome. Um, uh, which I guess is also the feeling I get from the immigrant areas, the... Um, almost Asian quality that they have. Yeah, my usual fetishes. Mm -hmm.